the death of Muammar Gaddafi. This is Barack Obama, a former president of the United States of America. He's addressing the public on the death of this man, Muammar Gaddafi, a former president of this North African country called Libya. He was killed by these militants just outside of this city called Set with the help of a NATO airstrike. This marks the end of a long and painful chapter for the people of Libya, who now have the opportunity to determine their own destiny in a new and democratic Libya. New and democratic Libya. Hold on. This is what everyone at the time thought would become of Libya after the death of this man. A utopic place where human rights are prioritized and people chose whom they want as their ruler. But little did the world know what was going to befall this country in the end. Libya remains a mess. The country continues to grapple with civil war, humanitarian crises, foreign interventions and the threat from ISIL. The aftermath of the ousting of this controversial leader was a chaotic Libya with no central government, a breeding ground for terrorist groups like the ISIS and the Al-Qaeda, and a place where human rights abuses are more prevalent now than they've ever been which has left many wondering if Libya was better off under this man than without him. A country which hasn't had a stable government since Muammar Gaddafi was forced from power. They're worse now than they ever were. People are getting their heads they're chopped off, they're all. being drowned. They, they, they will die to, to protect me and my, my people. On the 17th of December 2010, this young Tunisian man by the name of Mohamed Bozizi had an argument with this female police officer by the name of Fadia Hamdi over the confiscation of his vegetable cart from which he made a living as a vegetable vendor. Frustrated with police harassment, he then set himself on fire. He would later die in hospital a few days following the incident. At the time, you think that this act carried no significance. This seemingly insignificant stunt sparked countrywide protests against the then Tunisian government, which led to the stepping down of the then Tunisian president, Mr. Ben Ali. This protest would soon spill into neighboring countries to cause what we know today as the Arab Spring. Dozens of Arab men and women began self immolating in a copycat fashion, sending shockwaves across the Arab world, a chain of events that left an indelible mark on many Arab nations. NATO welcomes the resolution from the UN Security Council. This resolution sends a strong and clear message from the entire international community to the Gaddafi regime. Stop your brutal and systematic violence against the people of Libya immediately. Of the countries that were plagued by the Arab Spring, Libya was the first country that saw a direct international military intervention through this organization called NATO, with the help from some Arab League nations that had interests in Libya. This military operation was taken under the pretext of protecting civilians. But as you'll see later in this video, this was far from the truth. When demonstrations broke out in the Libyan city of Benghazi, sparked by the arrest of this human rights activist, Fatih Tabel, the protesters demanded that Gaddafi steps down. Gaddafi had ruled this country since 1969, following a coup d'etat in which he overthrew this king, whose name was King Idris, whom he thought was a western puppet. Gaddafi had ruled this country for 42 years, so crushing this protest was a piece of cake, right? Turns out this wasn't the case. Gaddafi ordered the Libyan security forces to use water cannons and fire rubber bullets towards the crowd. As the protests began to spread across the country, angry mobs would set police stations on fire. The Libyan security forces retaliated with the use of live ammunition against these people. Realizing that the situation was getting out of hand, Gaddafi made this speech. <laughs> And this speech would give Western countries an excuse they'd long been waiting for to take Gaddafi out of power because of his anti-Western attitude. 
the United Nations will then adopt a resolution expressing grave concern over the situation of the Libyan people and made a list of demands among which were demanding an immediate end to the violence and that the international community stops trading military equipment with Libya. Libya failed to comply with these demands and the Security Council gave permission to member states to take all means necessary to protect civilians and civilian populated areas under the threat of attack in Libya. It also gave a go-ahead to Arab League nations to cooperate with these countries for the same mission. In March 2011, French fighter jets launched attacks on the Libyan army's armored vehicles, while the US and British submarines fired missiles to destroy Libya's air defense facilities, leaving the country vulnerable to airborne attacks. During the course of its operation, many civilians fell victim to NATO's airborne attacks. What you're seeing right now is a report released by the Human Rights Watch, following several field investigations on each of the sites that were bombed by NATO airstrikes. This report shows that while NATO's mission was to protect civilians, it ended up claiming casualties of the very civilians it claimed to protect. These two images captured by GOI show the destruction made on civilian houses by a NATO airstrike. The one on the left was taken on the 6th of August 2011, showing these civilian houses before a NATO airstrike, and the one on the right was taken on the 9th of August 2011, showing a complete destruction of these houses following a NATO airstrike. We see the same pattern repeat itself across different cities in Libya. On the morning of October 20, 2011, as Gaddafi's convoy raced across the western outskirts of his besieged hometown of Set, a NATO-operated drone fired airbus bombs to intercept this convoy, killing dozens of Gaddafi's fighters while injuring Gaddafi himself. Anti-Gaddafi rebels tracked him down and pulled him out of this drainage pipe in which he was hiding, and they viciously assaulted him. They then loaded his seemingly lifeless body into an ambulance. While we don't know the eventual cause of his death, some claim that he was shot dead soon after being taken away by the ambulance. Following this chaos, Libya held elections in 2012 and elected a new legislative body called the General National Congress, otherwise known as the GNC. Islamist influence in this new legislative body quickly grew. The GNC's refusal to step down following the expiration of its electoral mandate made this man, with the help of the Libyan National Army, invade Tripoli and Benghazi in an operation codenamed Operation Dignity. It demanded that an election be held to replace the GNC with a new legislative authority, which would be called the House of Representatives, hoping that this would put a stop to the growing influence of Islamists in the government, as well as dismantling Islamist movements like the Muslim Brotherhood. Following this election, in which Islamists suffered heavy defeat, they refused to concede and eventually the Libyan Supreme Court ruled in their favor. This court ruling formed a rift between the newly formed House of Representatives, based in the eastern city of Tobruk, and the GNC based in the capital of Tripoli, in the western side of the country. And with no central government, Islamist groups such as the ISIL and Al-Qaeda took advantage of the chaos, adding more confusion to the already complex conflict. The legitimacy vacuum that formed as a result of this court ruling led to a brutal civil war in which foreign powers supported opposing sides. These are the countries that supported the UN-backed government in Tripoli. And these are the countries that supported the Tobruk-based government. Self-centered interests motivated each of these countries to get involved in this mess. Countries like Turkey and Russia saw an opportunity to secure oil resources and maritime boundaries in the Mediterranean while the UAE and Egypt's main aim was to stop the spread of the Muslim Brotherhood. Italy was especially motivated to stop the influx of illegal immigrants across the Mediterranean and the threat that terrorism posed to Europe due to Libya's proximity to the European territory. If NATO successfully carried out its mission to protect civilians, then why this? The death of Gaddafi left the country with no central authority. This would divide the country into several factions of power, each one of them driven by the desire for power and with it, the control of our Libya's oil resources, which are the most abundant in all of Africa. 
With the current political instability in Libya, you'd ask yourself what the real goal of NATO's military intervention was in the first place. You see, NATO's primary mission was to protect civilian lives and not regime change, but the evidence on the ground suggests that the latter was true. In breach of the United Nations Resolution 1973, France, the UK and the US militarily aided Libyan rebels, providing them with reconnaissance and military intelligence to assist them in the fight against government troops, which eventually led to the toppling of Gaddafi. It's also worth noting that the decision to carry out a military intervention was based on unverified claims of Gaddafi-approved atrocities by the media. Countries like the United States and France were extremely alarmed by Gaddafi's influence on the African continent and they wanted the intervention to serve their own interests and not the interests of the Libyan people. Gaddafi's anti-US and anti-European attitude is what made a regime change seem plausible to many Western countries. The then French president Nicolas Sarkozy took advantage of the situation in Libya to gain popularity before his country's elections. According to this article published by The Guardian in 2011, Nicolas Sarkozy wanted to, quote, prove that France still matters on the global stage. At the time of the intervention, Libya exported 85% of its oil to Britain, France, Italy and Spain. Of these countries, Italy received 28% of its oil from Libya, France received 17% and Britain received 8%. It's also important to note that Tunisia and Egypt also witnessed similar revolts, but no such military intervention was proposed for these countries because they did not offer much in terms of their oil resources to be lucrative targets for the NATO members. According to Hillary Clinton's leaked emails, French humanitarian flights to Libya carried executives from the French oil company Total and from other European companies toward meetings with the Libyan National Transition Council even before Gaddafi died. The other motivating factor was Gaddafi's proposal to replace the US dollar with the gold dinar in oil transactions, which would have weakened the US and French influence in Africa's oil producing countries. Syria, Yemen, Libya, Egypt, Tunisia and Morocco. All these countries were affected by the Arab Spring, but only one of them was singled out for a military intervention for the sole purpose of removing the threat of an independent Africa posed by Muammar Gaddafi, which would have jeopardized the Western influence on this continent. Gaddafi's idea of a united Africa and the elimination of the US dollar as a medium of oil transactions are a few examples of just how ambitious this man was in creating an independent Africa. The pursuit of self-centered goals by the West and the allure of global influence have seen the demise of this guy and have reduced one of the most successful countries in Africa to this.